All right, Merry Christmas once again. We are on Sunday number three of Advent. This is Joy. And for those of you that were noticing the sign last week, that wasn't their fault. They had went by the bulletin, and the bulletin was messed up because I copied and pasted, and I copied and pasted the wrong thing. And <sighs> again, I only have so many brain cells to devote to things, and if I devote them to too many things at one time, then something gets messed up. And last week, it was the bulletin. So as long as the bulletin is all we're messing up, it's a good week, and we're doing all right. So there you go. Now, joy. This is the easy one because you know what it is, which is also why it's the hard one because you know what it is. And like the candle, we don't always have it. (laughs) We're working again. Now, cover this all the time. John 16, beyond a shadow of a doubt, what do you know is true about John 16? There were 15 and a half chapters before this spot, so what do we not want to ever do? We do not want to just airdrop into the middle, and that's kind of what we're doing. So rather than try to recap an entire gospel, I can't do that quite as well as I did like the first three or four chapters of Romans last week. In a nutshell, Jesus has completed or is completing his earthly ministry. At this point in John 16, the apostles and Jesus are marching around Jerusalem at night. They are moving from the upper room to the garden, and you know what happens once they get to the garden. That's the arrest and everything that happens from that point moving forward. So what Jesus is doing is giving last-minute instruction. We are encouraging the disciples to be in the world as the witnesses that they are supposed to be. Now, why does that matter to us? Because, Christian, they are going into a hostile world, and they think they are going into that hostile world without Christ. That's a happy place to be, isn't it? Yeah. That's one of the reasons why we mess up our joy so often. As we get the hostile world right, but we think, too, that Christ has left, and he has not. So what we want to see is what the encouragement to them would have been so that we can see where our anchor is and know that it actually holds. So that's the goal. Ready to dive in? Oh, it's going to be one of those mornings, huh? All right. We'll dive in anyway, whether you're ready or not. I think the problem is all the talkers are sitting on one side of the room, so it just kind of murmurs now. It's just, you know, just, just going to be what it is. All right, verse 16. Let's go. A little while, and you will no longer see me. Oh, that's just a happy place to start off with, isn't it? What everybody wants to hear from Jesus. Hey, I'm leaving. Bye. Now... This is not the first time that he has told them told them this. As a matter of fact, this is a repeat and one of the reasons why he must encourage them now. They're already a little bit depressed because they are hearing this for a second time. If you go back to John 16, 5 and 6. I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. So you know when you said it the first time they were upset. You've then encouraged them, and now you're repeating it a second time. Is that going to make them any happier than it did the first time you said it? No. Does it make it any less true? No. Also no. Christian, always, always remember this. There is neither joy nor comfort in falsehood. Ever. Ever, 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 ever. We, amongst all people, should be a truthful people. And what I mean by that is not co- not cooperating with the things of the world and not going along with the lies of the world, whatever they may be. In other words, husbands, your pastor is now giving you permission. When she asks you if the pants make her look fat and the answer is yes, say yes. <laughs> See, just making sure you're paying attention. Now, notice the caveat. If the answer is yes, say yes. If the answer is no, say no. No, No, that's bad, and she gets to elbow you then. (laughs) I give that as a silly example because it's stuff like that that we give ourselves a pass for, isn't it? It's stuff like that that we give ourselves. It's okay. It doesn't really hurt anything. Christian, guard your heart, guard your mind. Always remember, terms and conditions may apply. Your mileage may vary. You have to live in this world, but make sure you're living in it with your eyes open and your mind firmly fixed upon a hope in Christ. There is neither comfort nor joy in falsehood. Over time, anything that is a lie will eat at you and begin to devour you slowly over time. This is why there is a rule in my house. Could you, can, you can imagine this with me in camera. And we'll vouch for this one because she's usually good at vouching for the things like this. Don't ask me questions you don't want to know the answers to. 
If you are the least little bit concerned about what the answer might be, do not ask me because you know what you're going to get? Mm -hmm. I'm that guy. Why? Because it's true and it has to be. And if it's true, it has to be said because it is true. Because there is neither joy nor comfort in falsehood. Nobody wants to hear this. The disciples do not want to hear that Jesus is going away. They do not want to hear that he is dying. They do not want to hear the way that he is dying. They have not wanted to hear it since they began marching to Jerusalem all the way back in the Galilean ministry. If you want a good picture of that timeline, read Luke. Luke arranges his material like a march, and he carries the, the, the way the Luke, that Luke's narrative is laid out. Jesus his ministry carries him all the way out of Jerusalem, or all out of Jerusalem, all the way out of Israel in Luke 9, and from Luke 10 all the way until the crucifixion, Jesus is systematically moving southward to the cross, and then moving up the mountain into Jerusalem. So read the Gospel of Luke and you'll see just how many times they've been warned and how many times they've been told, and they didn't want to hear it because they don't want to believe it, and that doesn't matter. It is true, and you have to deal with the world the way that it is, not the way that you wish it would be. Now, that point should be obvious in a fallen world, but but why am I hammering it? Because again, that tug, that constant pull. This is what Paul warned us about, and we're going to cover this, and we're going to go over this in just a second. We're going to expand on this. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Realize this, that in the last days... All right, time out. Christian, when are the last days? See, don't mess yourself up from your prophets. Where we talk about in that day or in the last day. In the last days, that's you. The last days have been a little around 2,000 years. From the time of Jesus' ascension, we have entered into the last days. Why? Because what's left to do? Assemble the kingdom in Christ to come back. That is the work of the last days. And then there is coming a final day. So whenever you read in your testament in the last days, that's the world that you inhabit. That's the world Timothy was going to inhabit, and that is why the instruction is so vital. So, in the last days, the world that you live in, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. I would like to give you a quick little demonstration about how insidious sin is in the world and why it is so important that you be people of truth in everything. Anything in that list jump out of you as though it didn't belong? Anything that just seemed out of place? Here, uh, rapid fire, real quick. Put it in your back of your mind when you catch it. One of these just seems like it almost shouldn't be there. Lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Anything seem like maybe it shouldn't be on that list? Now I think the ungrateful one. Yeah, that always jumps out at me. Disobedient to parents is up there with being unholy. <laughs> it's up there with being haters of good and revilers. I mean, it's up there with being people who lack self-control. By the way, um, it's in the Romans 1 list also. So if you ever read the Romans 1 sin list, uh, disobedient to parents is also in that list. Why does that one make the list? All right, let's come around. This will be fun. What's the purpose of parents? Train up a child in the way that he goes, and when he is old, he will not depart from it, right? What was the purpose of that commandment? Why should you have honored father and mother in the Ten Commandments? So that it will go well with you in the land. What is the baked-into-the-cake assumption of that? That parents are teaching their children what? Who God is, what he has accomplished, and how you live in light of those things. Which means for you to dishonor parents and walk away from that command is to walk away from the instruction of who God is, what he has done, and what that means for how I live in the world. So to have an entire generation, an entire community that is not following after their parents is to have an entire community that is not following after who God is, what he has done, and how we live in light of that. That's why it's included in the list. Now, Christian, let's grab the world for a second. What's the purpose of parents from the world's point of view? We can make sure they're happy, make sure they get a good job, make sure that they know all the things of the world. Look, this was, this was the one that was beaten into me as a kid. Remember? So I am, what year is it? Hold on. When is it in the year? I'm 41 years old. I had to... <laughs> 
just stop and think about that for a second. It's only downhill from here, I'm telling you. I've been right. <laughs> The best part about that is Cameron will vouch for this also. I've been telling Cameron how old I am for at least 15 years because she's like two and a half years younger than me, so I just keep going, wait until you're my age and your back goes and your hips hurt and, you <laughs> and she just laughs at me. And now she's getting to that age and I'm like, see, 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 it's catching up to you, it's catching up to you. So my entire life, you know what was beaten into me? You got to go to college. Why do you have to go to college? So you can get a good job, so that you can pay all your bills, so that you can take care of your family, so that you can have nice things. This is the point of my world. Now, where is... You guys are my age. You didn't hear that at all, did you? <laughs> the eye roll oh, constantly. Now, where is the focus of all of those things? Got to get good grades. Got to behave yourself. Got to get into a good school. Got to get a good job. No, it's not on me. Where is my focus in all of those goals? They're all in the world. Every last one of them is worldly. It's almost like it's the exact opposite of who God is, what he has done, and how I live in light of that. I actually had this argument years ago. I was in, a, um, I was in an association in North Carolina, and we owned an old camp. So like it was on a little pond, and they had bunk houses, and nobody was going to camps anymore. It was just that's that's a, a holdover from the 70s and 80s and 90s. It just aren't as many kids going to Christian camps anymore. So they were looking at: Do we sell it? Do we want to convert it into something? What do we want to do with it? One of the ideas that came up was to convert it into a more of a school system, because North Carolina homeschool laws are such that you can form a homeschool co-op like that. You literally just have to inform the state that you're now a homeschool co-op, file one form, and that's the end of it. And like you could form a homeschool co-op and be a blessing to the families in the area and be able to bring people in to do tutoring and all sorts of things and allow students to move at paces that are outside of a school system. And you know the first thing? Well, how are we going to measure that so we can make sure that kids can go to college? Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. It's ingrained. It's part of a worldly thinking. By the way, if you went to college, not a problem. If you didn't go to college, also not a problem. But this is the, this is the thing that we do to ourselves is we bring all of our goals down. This is the lie of the world. This is why I tell you not just what you're doing, but why you're doing it. You want to encourage your kids to go to college? Encourage your kids to go to college. Why? And don't give me a worldly answer. Don't give me a worldly answer. Is your kid capable? Can they afford it? Can it be a blessing? Those are good answers. Those are lifted up. Those are stewardship answers. Those are service answers. The minute your eyes start to come down, you know what we just found? We just found our idol. What do we do with the idols? Ah. That's part of the warning here, and it's part of the reason why, even though Jesus is giving them something they don't want to hear, they still have to hear it. Remember, what does sin corrupt? Everything. Everything. Not some of the things, all of the things. We even have a fancy theological term for this. We've done this before. The noetic effect of the fall means that sin corrupts the way that you think. Once again, Christian, why you have to have a renewing of your mind based on a change of heart that has been wrought by the Holy Spirit. Because the way that you think about this world is being co corrupted constantly by that pull. Guard yourself and ground yourself in the truth. Always. Not some of the time. Always. So Jesus is doing that. A little while and you will no longer see me. And again a little while and you will see me. Always remember this part. How does the book end? <laughs> because that's the difference between eyes being brought down and eyes being lifted up. Acts chapter 2. Men of Israel, this is Peter's sermon, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But... God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Even in the midst of his sermon, the warning of the work that was done, the warning of the evil, but the hope of what? 
that death is defeated, that sin has been overcome, that the kingdom is now secured because of who God is and what he has done. This is the future hope that Jesus started with back in John 14. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am going, there you may be also, and you know the way where I am going. Notice again, multiple times they've been told the same truth, and multiple times they still keep getting depressed because they're missing the forest for the trees. Christian, don't do that. Don't do that. When you encounter the sin of the world, when you encounter corruption, when you encounter the things that are trying to drag you down, remember they are defeated. Sin is overcome. Christ is victoriously waiting. Is the victory finally realized? No, but it is promised of God, and that is as good as any promise you will ever receive, which means you can live hopefully because you can live triumphantly. So, the disciples. you got to love the disciples because despite all the history, they're still human, and that's my favorite thing about them. So verse 17, some of his disciples then said to one another, what is this thing he is telling us? A little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me, and because I go to the Father. Okay unheard of in the history of Scripture for anyone to go away and come back, right? It's just completely unheard of. <laughs> I mean, before Jesus, right? Never happened before. The death rate's 100%. We know this. <laughs> Second Kings chapter 2. As they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and his horsemen. And he saw Elijah no more. <sighs> Did we see Elijah no more? Do we ever see Elijah again? Matthew chapter 17. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on the high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, what does that mean? Pay Stop, pay attention. Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. Now, doesn't that make it obvious? Elijah left, and Elijah came back. You saw him. Jesus is telling you he's leaving and coming back. This is something God can accomplish, right? And yet they're still not getting it. They're sitting here wondering and asking questions. Always remember, Christian, one, have a little grace. We like to lie to ourselves and say, you know, if I saw the miracles, and I saw Jesus calm the storm, and I saw Jesus walk on water, and I saw Jesus raise the dead, I wouldn't have been like that. Yes, you would. Yes, you would have. You two are a product of your world just like everybody else. If I had seen the Red Sea and I had seen the manna from heaven and I had seen the thunder in the mountain, you'd have been like, I don't want to go in the land. It's scary. They have tall people. Ah. You'd have been just like the Israelites as they were in a panic. You'd have done the same thing. It's okay. Well, it's not okay, but you know what I mean. Hindsight is always twenty twenty, which is one of the reasons, Christian, you should have joy. How good is your hindsight when it comes to spiritual things? <laughs> How good should it be? Why should your hindsight be so amazingly good? Because they did what? They wrote in a book. <clears throat> they wrote in a book. This is why you are not dependent on me. This is why whenever somebody, and we've done this a thousand times, this is why whenever somebody gets up there and be like, God told me, maybe, Maybe not. You know what I know God told me? What's in the book? Because that's objective, and that can be argued about, and that can be verified, and that can be checked. The stuff that comes out of your head, uh, you know, maybe he told you, maybe he didn't. i got to flip a coin. You know what I'd rather go by? I'd rather go by the objective standard that Christ has given. I'd rather trust in that. This is important. Now... They don't have good foresight. They only have decent hindsight. You should have perfect hindsight. How good is your foresight? You're still dealing with what on that pole. <laughs> this is why you pray. This is why you continue to read. This is why you have to be grounded in a community of believers that will encourage you and strengthen you and call a spade a spade and tell you you look fat in those jeans. It matters. Just making sure you're still paying attention. <laughs> I want people that will tell me the truth. You know what I don't want? A bunch of people who are willing to lie to me. I grew up in that house. You know how miserable it was? <laughs> you know how easy it is to believe stuff when everybody will lie to you at the drop of a hat? 
especially when there's only three people in the house. How's that for fun? I want truth. I want comfort that is real and based on something that is tangible, and I want to build my life on things that are a solid ground that can be evaluated, can be argued about, that can be discussed, and that can be cut, and, and then can allow us to come to real understandings and decisions. I want it based on Scripture, and then I want to pray my butt off, knowing that it is God who will strengthen me to give me the strength to live in light of what I know. That is where I have to rest day by day. And the beauty of all of that, and the reason we can have joy in this world, is that this is what he has promised to do. That he has promised that he will not abandon us. That he has comforted us with the understanding that he is returning. That he has promised us a future kingdom in which righteousness reigns, in which God dwells, in which sin is done away with. And then he sends us out into the midst of this world and says, You have overcome. <laughs> this is supposed to be good news. We forget that, fall into the trappings of the world, live like the pagans live, and then go, why do I have joy? Why is the little candle just a flickering over there? It's because I have forgotten who I am, and I have forgotten why I am. Don't do that, Christian. Never, ever do that. So, verse 18. They were saying, what is this he says about a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Okay. Second thing, have a little grace. Understand that you have a book and recognize that the Holy Spirit is not optional equipment. Okay? And always remember that about the world in which you live. John 14. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. What's the difference between Peter standing around the fire on the night of Jesus' trial going, Jesus, Jesus, what's, what's a Jesus? I, I, don't, I don't know any Jesus. Never, never heard of a Jesus. And then standing before the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 4 going, I don't know what you people are smoking, but I got to do what God says and not what you say. What's the difference between an apostle standing around arguing going, I have no idea what he's telling me. And then Acts 2, Acts 4, Acts 5, Acts 10, Acts Acts 15, Acts 20 through 28, where these uh, same apostles are boldly proclaiming Old Testament faith in fulfillment of Christ. What separates that? That's the work of the Holy Spirit. What takes a group hiding for their lives and turns them into a group that is willing to go into the ends of the earth and face certain death to proclaim the glories of Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's what he accomplishes in his people. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one in aroma from death to death to the other an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? For we are not like many, peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. Why? Because this is what Christ has put into us. This is one of the reasons why I encourage you to be a people of truth. If you are capable of lying to the world and lying to the people that you love the most constantly about the smallest of things... Isn't the Holy Spirit in the corner looking at you, shaking his head? Because he does that to me. <laughs> so I give you that little example. Him just, you better stop it. You better stop it. This is not a good road. This is going to end badly. It's again why I tell you to plant your life and live amongst a community of believers. Because you can fake it for a little while, can't you? After a while, who you are comes flying out. This is why I don't. This is why I give you such terrible stories from my childhood and who I am and my problems. Because eventually, all of those things that have shaped me, guess what they're going to do? <laughs> they're going to come out, and I can try to pretend to be somebody else. And one, I'll be miserable. Two, you'll be miserable. And then three, we'll all hate each other when we find out that I've been faking it for all this time. No, better to be me, who I am, redeemed of God, trusting in His salvation, and better for you to be you, the exact same thing. Not me, but you know, you trusting in God, redeemed and trusting for his salvation. Never be ashamed of the road that we have been down. Be ashamed of the sin that we still cradle and still coddle. 
those are the wars that we should worry over. Those are the wars that we should be fighting daily. You can't fight the war from 20 years ago. It's either won or lost, but it's already done. I can deal with the stuff now. And when I spend all my time looking at the stuff then, you know what I'm more inclined to do with the stuff now? Ignore it. Hide it. Make excuses for it. Eh. I found my idol. What do we do to the idol, children? Kill. Kill it with fire. Fire! Or if you prefer 1970s, fire. Nee, 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 nee. There you go. <laughs> There's my bad disco dancing. That's as much as you get. No. This is how we have to live in the world. This is how we have to live with the understanding of the why. And I know I don't give you concrete examples of these things always, but that's because I'm not you. I don't work where you work. I don't have the family that you have. I don't have the, the friends that you have. I don't go to the grocery stores you go to. It, it, you have a different world. I have to trust that the Holy Spirit is going to go, okay, you heard what the man said, right? Now here's where you need to apply it. Because I go through that. Trust me, you have any, have any idea how many times I've sit like on a Tuesday morning in a shower going, did you listen to you on Sunday? <laughs> or how many times I look at my house and go, does anybody in my house listen to me on Sundays? Because <laughs> you know what I discover more often than not? <laughs> the answer is no. Do you know who listens to me the least? You. <laughs> Because most of the time when I'm talking to you, I'm talking to me as well. Because I live in the same sinful world you live in. And I deal with the same sinful problems you live with, you deal with. And I have to overcome them the same way you do. By relying on the work of God and trusting the Holy Spirit. To go, okay, today is the day we kill that one. Let's get to work. Put your big boy pants on and let's go to work. Because today's the day we deal with that one. And tomorrow, we'll deal with that one tomorrow. Because that's what tomorrow's deal is for. And in the meantime, renew your mind. Know who you are, know why you are, and live in a world accordingly. So, I wonder if Jesus had a little bit of sarcasm in his voice. Makes me, one of those things I'm going to, just one of those questions that's on my list for when I get to heaven. So, you know, I want to know, were all the areas I think there was some sarcasm? Was there really some sarcasm and snark in there? Because if there isn't, I'm going to be so disappointed, just so you know. Verse 19, Jesus knew what they wished to question him, and he said to them, are, are you deliberating together about this, that I said a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Now, what's the answer to that question? The answer answer is yes. Yes, they are deliberating about that. Now, you ask that question because, Christian, the disciples in the upper room have heard this from Jesus and are now sitting amongst themselves, talking about Jesus like he isn't there, and trying to figure out what this means. What, pray tell, should they be doing? You would think that, wouldn't you? Ask, right? The dude is sitting right there. I mean, if I'm sitting in a room with you, and there's only like a handful of us, and we're talking about something, and I say something that you think is confusing, do I want you to ask your neighbor about the confusing thing I said? I want you to ask who about the confusing thing that I said? Me! And I always tell you at the end of the service, you're like, if you have a question, what should you do? Ask it, because odds are somebody else did. This is just astounds me. Jesus is like, um, are you over there just talking? Because like, you realize while they're murmuring about, what is Jesus doing? <laughs> just walking along with him and like, guys, seriously, I'm right here. But again, this shouldn't be new. Matthew chapter 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. What man is there among you when his son asks for a loaf will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, I always love that, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Now again, always remember, Sermon on the Mount is a little tricky sometimes because it's not always a perfect one-to-one -one promise. Remember, Sermon on the Mount begins with a beating of everyone involved. I mean, just a complete and utter beating of how they are incapable and unable. Oh, you want to know who's going to inherit the earth? Well, you've got to be poor and hunger and thirst and you must be perfectly righteous and this is your standard for sin. You haven't slept with your neighbor's wife. Good deal, but have you looked at her with lust? If you have, you've slept with her. That does not excuse to go do it anyway, but it's a reminder of where sin actually begins, which is not outside of you, but inside of you. 
Catch your anger. Catch your giving. Catch how you relate to family. That's all of chapter 5. Chapter 6 is then practical application. How do you pray? Why do you pray? Why do you fast? What's the purpose of your life? Do you have worry? Do you have anxiety? There's a cure for that. And then chapter 7 is practical application. You know what I should do? You know, one of these days I should write a book on this. might be useful. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> For those of you that don't get the joke, it's, I'm joking about that because I did. So anyway, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not sure it was very useful, but it is what it is. But now you get into things like this. Ask, seek, knock, and it'll be given. Why? Because if you've understood what was going on in chapter 5 and your, your total inability, and you have seen your failures in living in chapter 6, then the stuff that you seek to do in chapter 7 must be done in whose power? God's, not yours. It's about getting your eyes raised up, about getting your life, the focus of your life off of you and upon God. This is who they are. This is what they should be doing now, recognizing that we have the answer to all of our questions, and yet our stupid sinful selves are doing what? arguing amongst the other sinners about which one has the best understanding when the answer is right there. Now, Christian, are you walking around Jerusalem in the dark with Jesus? That sounds like a bad sermon illustration that could go so many terrible places, doesn't it? The answer is no, you're not. So where do you go to find your answers? Where do you have them? John 16 again. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whoever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. I asked this, I think I asked this on a Wednesday. What's the number one production of the Holy Spirit? Scripture. The recalling to mind of the things that Jesus spoke so the apostles could write it down. Realize that about your New Testament. We have done this before, but it's been a while, so might be, we might try to repeat this real quick. Every writing you have in the New Testament comes from an apostle or an associate of an apostle. It is an apostolic testimony or a recording of an apostolic testimony. So, um, Matthew, an apostle. Mark, traveling companion of Peter and Paul, who are, yeah, Peter and Paul, who are apostles. Mark is universally regarded as the, uh, as Peter's apostle. That is basically Peter preaching. It's one of the reasons why Mark's gospel is so short and so abrupt. Mark's favorite word is immediately, because if you were preaching to a crowd, what do you need to get to? You need to get to the next thing, and you're trying to keep people's attention and move along. So read Mark like you would a sermon, and it starts making a lot more sense. Luke, traveling companion of Paul, so that's basically Paul's gospel, so to speak. But it's Luke flat out tells you he interviewed the people involved. He, as he's traveling around with Paul, he has access to Paul. He runs into Peter. He is in Jerusalem where James is. He probably has access to John and Mary at some point. That's why you have the infancy narrative that you have in Luke that is not included anywhere else because Luke gets a chance to ask Mary and Mary gets to give him information that nobody else would have given because she was around. John, an apostle. Um, all of Paul's letters, Paul's an apostle. So Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Did we leave anybody out? I hope not. Paul. Paul is an apostle. Uh, Hebrews. <laughs> Sermon of Paul, written down by Luke. That is an official position. I'm dying on this hill until the end of time. So that is also from an apostle. Uh, James, half-brother of Jesus, regarded as a leader of the Jerusalem church. Jude, half-brother of Jesus. Same thing as James. First, second, and third John. John is an apostle. First and second Peter. Peter is an apostle. Revelation comes from John. He is an apostle. Everything in the New Testament comes from an apostle or a close associate of an apostle. Make sense? There you go. <laughs> now, don't ask me when, because that's a whole other convoluted discussion. But pretty much, with the exception of John's writings, everything is written before 70 AD. So you have the answers from Jesus. You get to go ask Jesus what he meant and how you should live in the world by going to where? Going to Scripture. So, Jesus goes on in verse 20. Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. That's not a new warning or a new comfort. Uh, John 15. 
Remember the word that I said to you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Again in John 16, they will make you outcast from the synagogue for an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is observing service to God. So how do you live in that world? What are you supposed to do? Your job is to figure out how to make the last part of that sentence a reality. The world will rejoice, you will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. That's where you live, Christian, is living each and every day, understanding the why of your life so that that is a reality. Because remember, what's the world coming for? What is sin coming for? Everything. Everything. Again, go back to our example from the very beginning. Trying to corrupt the very purpose of parenthood. Is there anything more basic and fundamental to a society than a family? It's almost like sin looked out and went, if we can corrupt the family, we can corrupt everything. You know why it almost looks like they did that? Because I'm pretty sure that's exactly what the plan was from the very beginning. So... <laughs> Destroy the family, destroy the community, destroy the community, destroy the society at large. We've talked about this a hundred times. We talked about this uh, years ago in Sunday school. Um, we think too often that we solve problems from the top down. If you don't believe me, watch cable news this weekend because you know what's coming up next, don't you? We just got finished with an election, so you know what that means. The next election will be what? The most important election of your life. <laughs> You think I'm kidding. They'll have breaking news banners and flashing lights and, and the whole nine yards because we convince ourselves that if, if we get this guy in this spot or this guy in this spot, now we got something. It's never worked that way. You want to save society? You have to save the people in society. You want a better world? You have to have better people. You want to have better people? You have to remove the heart of stone and replace it with the heart of flesh. You have to proclaim Christ. You have to save sinners. That's how this works. You get a better world by getting better people in the world and having more good people in the world. Hmm, how do we get the good people? Pray. If we teach them enough, if we just convince them enough, if we pass the right law, no. We change the heart, which leads, which leads to a change of mind, which changes the way that we live based on all of that. That's the marching order, and that's how we're supposed to live in this place day by day. Now, that starts with who, Christian? Where is your first ministry? <clears throat> At home. And it begins with who? You. You. Those uncomfortable conversations with you in the mirror, the answering who am I and why am I? so that I can make sure that my grief is joy by making sure that my heart is in the right place. James chapter 4. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep and let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. Your joy is found in Christ. Your hope is found in Christ. Your reason for everything is found in your submission and service to the God who has redeemed you. And remember, if that step hasn't occurred, none of this makes any sense. None of this makes any sense if the heart of stone has not been chiseled out and replaced with a heart of flesh. We can't expect a sinful world to suddenly go, well, you know, we've been persecuting those lovely people and hating them and deciding this, that, and the other about them. But you know what? I think we've decided today that was enough today. We have done enough today, and today we're gonna we're gonna take a reprieve. It's gonna be World War One on Christmas, and we're we're gonna stop shooting each other today, and we're gonna have tea and crumpets, and then we'll shoot each other some more tomorrow. Does sin do that? No, sin doesn't have vacations. And by the way, that's a that's a mostly true story about World War One. I'm I'm not making that part up, but <laughs> it's a different world. Sin doesn't believe in kindness. Sin doesn't have any love or hope or joy. It only has destruction. And that is why, Christian, your joy has to be placed somewhere else other than this place because sin is seeking to corrupt everything it touches in this place. And the battle is every single day until either Jesus calls you home or he returns. Now, you can root for whichever one you prefer, but recognize that that's your lot in life in the here and now. In the world that you live in now, always remember this part too. Who decided you would be here now? God did. 
God did. Like you're, you're in your 40s like me. You're in your 90s like Kathy. Who decided that we would be alive at this time? God did. God did. If you have kids and grandkids and you look at the world and be like, I don't want them to grow up in this world. You don't make that call. God made that call. Which means he has prepared and strengthened you for the work that you must do and he will prepare and strengthen them for the work that they must do. And half of the work that they must do is built on the work that you're doing now. If he has put you into this world, he has prepared you and gifted you for the work of this world. We do not go out unprepared and we do not live as though we are unaware. We are in all things his servants because of who he is and what he has done. And those two things have to happen in that order for you to actually live that way in this world. Anything else is your power, your strength, your hope. How much of that do we have? A whole lot of zero. 1 Peter 1. Greatly rejoice, even though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's where we live. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We may not love it. We may not even like it most of the time. But it is the world that God has gifted to us, and it is the work that he has gifted to us in the here and now. And it is the strength that he has given us also. So, Paul, um, sorry, Paul, I'm trying to be, I'm getting my names confused. Jesus concludes with an example, and this one will make sense to, this one's for you ladies, you ready? Well, some of you anyway. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain, because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. This, this makes sense. I am convinced that you women are all exaggerating labor pain. You know why? Because yeah. many, many of them did it again. Couldn't have been that bad. <laughs> you signed up for it, as the, as the French peas once said, a second time. <laughs> Therefore, it couldn't have been but so terrible. All right? I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. This makes sense as an example. Genesis 3.16, labor is bad, right? Nobody signed up for labor pains. God even warned you it's going to hurt extra now because you were bad. <laughs> but at the same time, children is good, right? Even your children are good. How do I know that? Because they put it in a book. Psalm 127. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. Now, let's carry the math equation over. What is Jesus talking about? You women signed up for labor a second time because, not because it didn't hurt any, but because there was more more joy at the end of it than there was pain at the beginning of it. And that's the reality as it is explained to me. Now, if you're the disciples here, you're looking at this and saying, crucifixion, bad. Because you don't want Jesus gone and you don't want Jesus dying. But salvation is good, so I guess we have to put up with the thing we don't like to get the thing that we do like. Now, here becomes a problem for you, Christian. Persecution, bad. God, good. We would like to get to the good end that God has promised, but avoid that whole persecution thing in the middle. Here's the question for you. Is persecution bad? <laughs> Here's the trick question of the day. Your immediate thought is, yes, anything I don't like, by definition, must be bad. Maybe not green bean casserole bad, but still bad. <laughs> Just making sure some of you guys are still paying attention. I know we have green bean casserole fans. I don't hold that against you most of the time. <laughs> Revelation chapter 2. You know it's a good Christmas when you're getting Bible readings out of the book of Revelation, right? Revelation chapter 2. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. The blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, so that you'll be tested. And you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Is that comforting? I mean, if you're going to get a prophecy from God to your church, wouldn't you like it to say, hey, persecution is coming, but I am going to redeem you out of it. You will not have to undergo it because I love you so much. Instead, it's, you're going to go to jail, and they're going to torture you, and they're going to kill you, but hold on. 
at the end is the accomplishment of all things. But again, Christian, this is the world. This is, this is our understanding. Remember, this was Peter before going into the arrest. Peter, I will stand with you unto death. I will never deny you, Jesus. And, Jesus? And yeah, well, but what does Jesus tell him? Satan has asked permission to sift you like wheat. And I've prayed for you. You know what that means, right? That the answer was what? The answer was yes! Satan wants to grind you to powder, and we told him it would be okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> Wait a minute. I didn't. I was not consulted. Do I get a vote? Okay, I don't get a vote. <laughs> but Jesus has prayed for you, that when you overcome, that when you make it to the other side, that you will strengthen your brothers. Christian, this is the world that we live in. This is the lot that we draw. Again, you wouldn't have chosen this world, but I got bad news for you. Any world you would have chosen would have stunk. Okay? Any world you would have chosen would have stunk because that world would have had sin too and you'd have had to deal with something you don't want to deal with. So rejoice. You have been prepared and gifted for this world and God is walking beside you. Psalm 118. From my distress I called upon the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is for me and I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I will look with satisfaction on those who hate me. How's that for attitude. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. I will look with satisfaction on those who hate me. <laughs> Why? You lose. Because it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter. You can't take away from me that which God has provided. You cannot undo what God has secured. Therefore, I rejoice in the midst of suffering. I rejoice in the midst of difficulty. I rejoice in the midst of sin because this is the lot that I have drawn and it is good for me because it demonstrates who God is and what he has done for me. Because if he hadn't, you know what I'd have done? Bye. I'm out of here. What's the human reaction when something hurts? Do you touch the hot stove and go, ooh, that is warm and it is burning my hand. People should be aware of this sort of thing. No, what do you do when you touch the hot stove? <laughs> you don't stub your toe and then dig it into the end table, do you? You'd be like, yeah, get it, get it. No, you stub your toe, say things you shouldn't say, and then pull your... <laughs> If it hurts, you pull away. Yet through the ages, Christians have willingly done what? They have stood in the midst of the fire. They have stood in the midst of the hatred. And they have smiled because God has changed them and strengthened them. Christian, same God at work then is the same God at work now. You have been gifted and prepared for whatever it is you may face in this world. Stand firm as you stand firm in Him. Verse 22. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and no one will take your joy away from you. This is the verse we read at the beginning when we, when we lit the candle. This is the doxology of Jude. To him, who is make you to, to, to him who is able to make you stand in his presence, blameless with great joy. That's us. That's the promise. That as we live, we live a life of mourning. We live a humble life. Not seeking after the things of the world, but seeking after the things of the kingdom. Forsaking the challenges and the tribulations and the things that are trying to pull us constantly. And recognizing that as we persevere, we do not persevere in our power, but in His. And as we persevere, we do not persevere to a world we are building, but to a kingdom that is being constructed day by day by Him. A kingdom that... Right, that they, a kingdom in which righteousness will dwell and God's presence will abide and we will know who he is fully. We will have trusted in the truth and we'll, we will have been set free by it and we will have joy then. Which means, Christian, if that is already accomplished, we should also have joy now. And if we don't, it's not because God has failed. It's because we've forgotten. So have the hard conversation, recognize the work that he has done, renew your mind, and live in this world with a recognition of who you are and why you are. Let's pray.